Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second of our webinar series, I suppose, for a uh, pre-return pre to action in the, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, tonight's presentation, we're going to look at the, the statistics in, in, in a club setting, and it will be presented by Pat Keane and Sean O'Donnell. Pat is from Newcastle West and is a primary school teacher in, in Mahuna there in, in Castle Ahan, very much involved with the underage in, in, in Newcastle West GA, and is currently a member of the Limerick Underage Hurling Academy and working with the Limerick Minor Hurling team. And, uh, on, on the sets. Sean, Sean from Gary Spillane, Sean O'Donnell, and before he crossed over the border into Kildari, uh, spent his uh, youth hurling with Gary Spillane. And Pat, Sean's a post primary school teacher in Scott, or sorry, in Skull Pole in Kilfinnan, and Sean's also currently involved with the Limerick Senior Hurling team. Uh, so let's go through the presentation, and if you have any questions, you can put them in the question bubble, which will be up on the top right hand corner of your screen. If you want to type in a question here, if you just click on that, a panel will open up on the, the right hand side and you can type in your question in there. And we'll answer all the questions at the end if we have some some time with that. So I hope you enjoyed the presentation and um, I'll hand you over there to Shaw now and he'll make a, a start for you. Thank you. Okay, Noel, I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, OK, guys, um, you're welcome to this evening's seminar. Um, I'm delighted to present here with with Pa. And um, we're looking at, uh, I suppose, the use of statistics and performance analysis uh, very much geared towards the club scene. So it's not geared towards you know, inter-county hurlers or, inter or the inter-county scene, very much geared to uh, if you're in Brough or Kilmallock or Newcastle West or you're in the Gaelic grounds and uh, your team is is, is playing in uh, either you know, a league or championship. And what are the principles that guide, I suppose, the development of, uh, of performance analysis and what is the practical application of it? So we have this evening's uh, seminar divided into, uh, into two uh, sections. So the principles that guide the analysis process um, I'm going to look after first and uh, the practical application of analysis on match day um, is going to be looked at by uh, PA um, in about maybe 15 minutes or so. So um, before I go through the, the practical application of uh, performance analysis, I'm first just I'm just going to go through um, I suppose my journey and how my journey has moved over time and uh, where uh, I started and I suppose uh, where uh, uh, hopefully uh, I'm going to go to um, in, in time. So um, I'm not sure if this um, is, is working. OK, so first point I'm just making here is just on my journey myself. So as Noel alluded to earlier on, um, I'm from Gary Spillane um, I heard with Gary Spillane all the ways up to uh, up to and including senior um, was delighted to be involved with the club and in around 2007 I uh, got married and moved to Kildare in County Cork uh, just over the border so um, what happened then was uh, doing a little bit of work on analysis with the club here in Kildare and Dennis Walsh who was the Cork senior hurling manager at the time approached me and asked me would I go and do a little bit of work with Cork so that took me right through to 2017 and uh, in 2017 then I got the opportunity to come back home and uh, I was delighted to take it at the time and uh, uh, was very very lucky then obviously in 2018 to be involved with the Limerick senior hurling team at that point so which is obviously a, a highlight of, of my career and um, no doubt about that um, I'm currently studying doing the masters in performance analysis in Carlo IT a uh, big shout out to Johnny Bradley and all the guys there and um, they've been very very helpful over the last year or so in uh, me developing myself as an analyst and looking at all the principles behind it and as a result some of I suppose the principles we're going to talk about this evening are guided by that and equally guided by uh, the GA accreditation process which was developed by Denise Martin and she has done huge Trojan work over a long period of time developing um, uh, developing a, an, an accreditation a system for club analysts and inter-county analysts and obviously we're, we're guided by both of those. So um, without further ado um, I, I'll proceed so so very very quickly so the first point is what is the role of an analyst and um, what is the role of an analyst particularly in a club setting and to me and I suppose this has been born over a long period of time. The role of a, of, of a club analyst is to support the coach and manager. And I've heard on a number of occasions where, where particularly, you know, 
people who are really, really experienced in the profession of performance analysis would always say that the coach is king. And really your job as an analyst is to support the coach or manager. So it's very definitely a coach and a manager and back, or I suppose driven process. And um, equally, you're to gain a clear picture of or as clear a picture of the performance as possible. And um, you all know, those of you who have been at games, you'll hear people, you know, anecdotally saying this guy had a good game, that guy had a good game, this guy was influential, that guy was influential. And your job as an analyst is to actually get rid of all that fog and actually create a really, really clear picture of what the actual performance looked like. And I suppose over a period of time is to develop a very, very clear picture of what is a winning performance, and uh, what are the characteristics of it, and how then can you best, uh, I suppose, manipulate or change the, the, the coaching um, system and your coaching systems to best, uh, I suppose, pay, best put you in a position to, to win. So that's really, really important. So equally, it's to give a context to a performance to explain why. So why did you, you know, why did you win? Uh, was it because you were winning puck outs in a particular position? Was it because, you know, your scoring efficiency was very, very high? What are the reasons for, for that actual good or equally bad performance? So it is to give context to a performance that is very, very important. So with that in mind, then there are three key, key questions. What do we measure? Which is really, really, really important. Uh, who decides what we measure? Um, is it the analyst who decides it? Is it the coach that who decides it? Is it the manager who decides it? it equally, is it the players who decide it? Uh, so that's a major question. Who decides what we measure? Uh, major one. And then, I suppose, in the practical application of it is, how is that measured? So when you are on the side of the field, in you know wherever you are, uh, where, how, are you actually going to go about measuring measuring uh, you know the 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 indicators that you have set out? So hopefully at the end uh, of of the presentation we'll have looked through those and we'll have looked through you know what do you measure, who decides it, and uh, how is that practically applied then? So that's really 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 important. So for me the most important thing is that it is coach led. So. It, Without a doubt, it's definitely not an, anal an analyst led. It should certainly be coach led. And the coach's philosophy of play, married with you know the identified values that the team ha has, they should dictate what is measured. And um, there is absolutely no point in if your coach uh, is really, really determined to measure maybe uh, you know puck out uh, or kick out efficiency and but you're measuring uh, scores and you're measuring maybe attack attack efficiency you know obviously both have to uh, both have to be married and without a doubt the values of the team that that they they are of utmost importance so as an example if possession is key then puck out or kick out retention and turnovers they should be recorded uh, if scoring is key attack return and shooting efficiency they should be recorded. If work rate is important to, 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 to your coach and to your team, uh, then defensive actions like tackle or applying pressure, they should be recorded. And um, so it is really, really important that you, you, you look at what the coach's philosophy is, what are the values the team have, and then you set out your uh, key performance indicators to reflect those. That is really, really, really important because as an analyst, there is uh, nothing worse than us going off and doing our own thing with our own ego and recording what we think is important, but that's not what is coach. So that's a, of critical importance that you, you that certainly the coach's philosophy and the team's values should dictate what is actually measured. So the keystones of analysis then, so what are they? So I just devised a, a, a flow chart for that. So. The, the, and how this flow chart works is really important. And I suppose, as you'll see, there is a picture to go into the center of it. And th that, I, I suppose, will reflect it. So identify the most important values the team has. So obviously, that's a conversation with the coach, with the manager. Uh, they will identify what the most important values that your team has. And they need to be just written down. So you need to have a chat about it. 
talk to your manager, talk to your coach and identify what are the most important values that the team has. They that those values then they should, I suppose, lead on to the development of a philosophy of play. So if the team's value, say, for instance, in a football sense is to hold hold possession, obviously your philosophy of play then will reflect that. OK, and the next point then is uh, equally to identify and coach then those team those team behaviors. So if our values are work rate and we're developing a, a philosophy of play around making sure that our work rate is very, very high, we need to ensure that that is coached, uh, you know, on the actual field practically. Then we look at, we develop key performance indicators around those. So now that we have identified our values, identified our philosophy of play, then we 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 then we look at developing our key performance indicators and I suppose finding out what those are. And then the final stage is the actual practical application of that, which is that you measure those key performance indicators during a performance. And um, so what very often happens is that the last piece happens first, that people start and they go and they, they go to a field and they start measuring maybe, you know, kick out or puck out retention statistics. And you, you, you look at those, but you haven't talked to maybe the coach or the manager around the values of the team and, and the coach's philosophy of play. So this, I suppose, uh, you know, flow of how the actual, how, how you devise your key performance indicators is very, very, very important. And I, I just put in there a picture of uh, of Jurgen Klopp, and I just thought this one was was really interesting with these two with these two head coaches. And it's all about building relationships. It's making sure that you can go to the coach and you can go to the manager and have a chat with them about your values, about your philosophy of play, that you identify the key behaviors that the team wants to you know that wants to show, and then you develop your key performance indicators and then you go and measure them. Uh, the final question with this then is, when should this conversation take place? So the conversation obviously at this point should take place early in the season. Now it was now it is a good time to do it because you know seasons are just about to actually start um, for, for clubs. So uh, as you're getting to a point now where you're starting your season, now is a really, really good time too identify your team's values, develop a philosophy of play, and then from that you're, you, you can develop your key performance indicators and you can start measuring them. So that actual, those keystones of analysis are very, 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 very important. Um, so the characteristics of good analysts, what, what, what should, what, if, as an analyst on, 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 I suppose, on the side of the field, what should you be doing or what should that look like? So the first thing is your job is to assist the coach to communicate his or her philosophy of play. Well, I suppose that can be done in a whole series of ways. And um, if you're running, say, for instance, you could do it just on a on a on a tactics board. Uh, it might be that you would have an app like Coach Note on your iPad or Tactical Pad on your iPad or your PC or or whatever actual you know a device you have, and that you are there to give assistance to the coach to communicate his or her philosophy of play. So there's a whole series of apps that really can assist you uh, with that. Equally then, now that you have identified a whole series of values, it is really important that you prioritize what is measured. One of the biggest mistakes that analysts make is that they actually measure too much. And if you're measuring too much, it becomes very, very difficult at maybe half time when the pressure is on to identify a number of, I suppose, key things that are actionable. So. The reason you prioritize what is measured and you cut it down to maybe three or four or five, and that's your maximum, is that you can really, really, I suppose, be accurate in what you're actually saying to the coach, and that then allows the coach to actually action uh, or, or to rectify whatever problems might exist at half time. So equally then, you need to define what is measured. So if you're measuring, say, for instance, uh, kick out retention, when do you consider the kick out to be retained? Is it, is it when it's kicked to the corner back? Is it when it's kicked beyond the 45? Is it when, it's, when the ball moves beyond the 65? What, what, is, what, what are you defining it as? So making sure that you know the definition, 
the coach knows the definition and the players know the definition is really important. And you'd be surprised that we all kind of think we know what a tackle is and we all kind of think we know what applying pressure is. But if you were to ask 10 guys in a pub what a tackle is, they'd give you 10 different, de different definitions. So it's really, really important that we really define that and get that, that right. Associated with prioritizing what is measured is providing reliable data. So get making sure that if we're collecting too much data, then the chances of us being unreliable, that increases. So our job is to ensure that we provide as accurate a data as we possibly can. Now, obviously, live in game, there is, you know, there there is the opportunity that you would not be accurate because things are happening so fast, particularly in hurling and football. But if we cut down what we measure to only the most important things, that then increases our probability of being reliable. And there's a whole series of apps then that can help you with that, whether you're using Sports Code or NAC Sport or Statapult, I know a lot of guys are using, or whether you're just using paper, and paper is of utmost importance in this. It might be the case that you just have developed your own uh, sheet of paper and you've developed your own stat sheet and you are using that. The critical thing if you're doing that is, again, you prioritize what you measure. Our job then equally is to make the complicated sim simple. Uh, talking actually about this to Johnny Bradley today, he was saying that, that, that as analysts, we're becoming a data translator, that we are making what is very, very complicated data at times, and we're visualizing it. So the use of heat maps and data visualization can be really, really important in this. And I know myself, the most simple way of recording, you know, puck outs is just sheet of paper with a field on it and put a tick or an X where the actual puck out or kick out actually landed. And that is really, really strong data visualization. So it doesn't have to be, you know, incredibly complicated. It is all about making this as simple as you possibly can. So our job is to make the complicated simple. And then after the actual performance, our job is to feed back to players and management. Again, at this point, I can't overemphasize the importance of being uh, accurate, and accuracy is really, really, really important, making sure that what we present is right. And you know, the, the final point here, uh, and I'm really strong on this one, is that when we're giving feedback, we've got to be as balanced as we possibly can and, uh, and as objective. And you know, I suppose if you're, if you're working with a club, it's very, sometimes it can be very, very difficult to be objective, but you have to be as job objective as you possibly can and let the statistics that you have created speak for themselves. So very often it's not about adding in your own personal opinion into it. It is about letting whatever stats you have generated, allowing those stats to, to do the talking for you. So there are the characteristics of what a good analyst uh, is. Few points then that, uh, that that I believe, uh, if you're working on the side of the field, that you should you, you should abide by. One is that you stick to the process regardless of the result. So, if you're up ten points or up fifteen points, your process remains the same. You still stay doing the same job. Equally, if you're down ten points or fifteen points with five minutes to go, again you continue to stick to your process and stick to the job you're completing. So regardless of what the result of the of the of the of the um, performances that you stick to what you do and um, this one I know Denise Martin is really really strong on I've I've heard her speak about it about 10 times is under the promise over deliver so when you're going in to speak to your uh, manager or your coach again you know give them maybe two or three things or four things that you're really really going to go after and you're going to give them really really accurate data on you can record yourself other data and you can do other jobs on top of it. So you under promise, over deliver. That's really, really important. There's nothing worse than you promising to do a whole load of a whole load of work and because of time constraints, you can't do it. So um, I think the coach, they'll find you much more reliable if you if you do that. Equally, it is important to reflect on your practice. Now, it's very, very difficult to do it in competition. That's really hard. But periodically, after competitions, really, really good practice to sit down, look at what you did and say, yeah, this I did really, really well. I was very, very strong on this point. At uh, this point, I need to work on. So it's very, very good to reflect on your own practice and equally to reflect on what you measure. 
Maybe you're looking at, you know, attack entry percentages and you're looking at your return of scores from 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 attacks. But that's not important and your stats bear that out to be not important. Well, then it's good to reflect on that and find out what is actually important. So that's that's pretty, uh, pretty, 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 pretty important. Equally to test your reliability. It's really good practice to, you know, if you have a video of the game, Go back in it maybe a month later and to actually test, am I reliable? Are the stats that I am creating, are they correct? That's a really, really good practice to do about a month or so or, 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 or so after a performance. And then spill time, spend time building relationships. You know, have a chat with players, have a chat with management and selectors. It is really, really important that you're not seen as that guy who's over in the corner with a clipboard, you know, ticking boxes. You know, make sure that you are building relationships and talking to as many people as possible. So that is a critically important one. I found that over over my years being involved, that really when you start putting time into building relationships, that your your analysis process can be really, really improved. And then fostering an, envir an environment of learning is critical that you want your players as much as possible to be looking for as much information as they can get off you and you really want to drive that forward and very often the analysts can really foster a really really keen environment of learning in within a team and if you can get that environment of learning uh, you're on to a winner immediately because immediately players will start looking to you as the person who knows what are the main, you know, what are the critical statistics that that the team are, are, are hunting? So that's really important. Key points to remember that I find are uh, that, that, that I find again, I'm just reiterating some of the points that I've made already. Accuracy of notation analysis is critical. So making sure that you're accurate is really important. And um, if you are going to, you know, go, simple things, you're going, you're presenting your stats and the score is wrong immediately your credibility is 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 not down so you're going to have to make sure that your 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 stats are accurate if you're using video and it is i suppose particularly if you're trying to foster a learning environment video is very 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 important the quality of the video is key height while now is not available is very 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 important particularly for the analysis process so you know if you're looking at it in, in, in this, in this, in this uh, I suppose, setting, what I would be saying is if you're videoing the game to be shown in the pub at maybe nine o'clock that night, uh, you need to think again about how you're videoing the game. Uh, you need, you know, as wide an angle as is practical. And if you can, say, get a really, really cheap GoPro camera and put it up uh, against the net at the back of the goals, that gives you a second camera angle. Uh, you could, if you bought a, a second one, you buy them in Little or Aldi for cheap enough. Uh, if you, you could buy them in, at second hand on eBay or on Amazon, put a second one behind the other goals, and all of a sudden you have three camera angles. So you know you don't have to spend a huge amount of money on it, um, but the the quality of the video is really, really, really important, um, and how you import it into to, to your to your computer is is critical. Equally, I've said this on a number of occasions, streamlining what you're measuring is very important, making sure you're hitting only the most important statistics, whatever they are. Again, they reflect your values uh, and the team behaviors that you want to you want to display, but streamlining them is critical. Equally, whatever targets you set, make sure they are reachable. Have your research done on it know what maybe a good performance in a particular KPI looks like, uh, look look at, make sure you know what an average performance looks like and make sure your targets are reachable. So like I, I, I know from a coaching sense, I've heard many, many coaches say they're looking for say one hook, one tackle per game um, is a great example, but you never see 15 hooks in, a, in, in inter-county hurling or at the moment or in club hurling. So, and uh, make sure that your targets are reachable. Equally, when we're, we're talking about fostering good relationships, catch players executing good behaviors. If you show them only doing the wrong thing all the time, they will actually replicate that behavior. So it's really, really important that you show them doing it right. 
No, you got to be real at the same time. If you're only showing a good behavior after a performance where you've been beaten by 15 points, that obviously isn't great. So make sure you catch them doing good. Get to the point as quickly as you possibly can. Avoid really long video sessions. So I'm not sure how long I'm going on for now, but that's really important. And you make your analysis relevant, right? Make sure that what you're analyzing is linked to coaching, right? And the final point is that unit meetings are very, very important and are good, and but they must be approved by coaches. If you're taking a guy on a one-to-one -one basis, you're going through some video, or you're go, you know, or you're doing it with a unit, you must make sure that the message you're giving is that message the coach wants you to give. So that is critically important because in this whole process, coach is king. So there are the principles behind it. I'm going to pass over there to Pa, and hopefully Pa will take control of this now, and uh, I'll stop. Uh, the sharing process and uh, uh, hopefully Pam will take control of, of, of this now. OK, um, have a, Noel, can you see that there? Is that true? Not to get there, Pam, no. No, not yet. OK, so I'll go back out there again. So. Um, sharing the slide. So now, okay. So hang on. One second there. Now. Sharing the stop. Okay. So screen and. There now, Noel, is that with us? Can you hear me, Noel? Yeah, you're in, Pat, that's it. Perfect, yeah, perffect. Thanks, Noel, there, Sean. Okay, sorry about that there, uh, everyone, just uh, a small bit of a technical issue there, but um, just uh, uh, thanks very much, Sean, there for introducing me and uh, for Noel as well and for the opportunity to present to you tonight. Um, I'm going to look at the application, of, uh, the practical application of stats on match day. And I'm going to look at it from a starting point from all clubs when you look at introducing stats. And as Sean said, it's a great opportunity now to start thinking about it with this window and with games uh, coming up in the season really start in off in a few weeks. Uh, just a bit of background on myself there. Um, I'm from Newcastle SGA where I currently coach our minor and hurling and football teams. Um, I've worked on the stats for Newcastle West at senior football and intermediate hurling last year. And um, for a number of years, I did it uh, on and off. Um, I'm just uh, semi-retired from a, what I'd like to describe myself as a distinguished junior B career. But um, currently, my main lead role is I'm a lead performance analyst for Limerick Minor Hurlers. Um, so I started off in this role uh, last year's uh, performance analyst. And I was thankful to the Limerick Hurling Academy uh, for giving me an opportunity to get involved and in particular to uh, Limerick Minor Manager Dermot Mullins and his management teams over the last two years. Um, the role that I'm in currently has been a massive help in helping me evolve and I'm constantly learning in the role. And one thing I'd like for people to take from this, uh, if you're starting out on your stats journey, um, one, one of the key points I really would like you to take is it's an evolving role. Don't expect that you're going to start uh, from work go and um, be successful and get all the data and the stats and everything that you need. Take it one step at a time. As Sean said, it's about building relationships and building that trust with uh, the coach or the manager and taking it from there. So um, the first thing I'm going to look at here now is the role of the stats person or the performance analyst. OK, so here, if you look at it, the, the stats person records the data. So a stats per person will record the what? The number of time a KPI or a game moment occurs. And um, again, the stats uh, person will record the data and provide reliable data to the management team. That's the role. A performance analyst, on the other hand, will look at the what, the why, and the how. So a performance analyst will identify problems in game and back it up with data. Um, and that we will back it up with data that is to assist the coach in communicating their uh, philosophy of play and it's coach led and they will prioritize what is measured for us. Um, so what I'm going to look at with you today is the practicality of the pre-game planning. 
in game what it looks like on match day, uh, how to handle the half time, uh, the chaos of half time, and I'm going to briefly look at the post game feedback and how you go about that. And again, our what we're doing has to be relevant to the team. Um, it really is very important that what we're doing is we're not just taking stats for stats sake. It's um, to link in with the coach's philosophy and therefore to plan to plan future sessions. So that's what we're going to uh, look at today. So key points uh, to remember just very quickly, some key points that I always look at when I'm doing in game are our stats that we take in helpful in game. So are they contributing to the success of our team? Uh, you're not there on the sideline, as Johnny said, they're ticking boxes and just that it has to be relevant to what is currently happening in the game. Again, post game, can the data gather guide preparation for the next match? Can it help the coach um, with his, his or her preparation for the next uh, session? Um, again, are we arming the coach with factual information to help the team progress? The information has to be accurate to help the coach. We need to be able to identify problems to guide the coaches training and for, most importantly the players because at the end of the day it's the players that this comes down to and the most important thing for me is that players understand that this is not a catch them out exercise and this is to show that their individual cumulative moments and games impact the outcome of the match for the team and it shows the the value of each player has to the game and in the in the winning or the losing of the game but it's also important that players see see it as a learning point and that for me would be very important um because i think sometimes players think okay if i didn't make this amount of tackles in a game and that or i'm not contributing in this and that that those stats that stats guy he's only there to catch me out and give the coach a reason to drop me it's very important that the coach sees it as um, an aspect for improving players and helping players de develop as pa Jones said last week in, in the mastery of the skills and in the in creating a safe to fail environment and using stats can be very important in that so uh pre-game so and um, what i've looked at here in the pre-game is you need to ensure that your role is defined and um, you need to know before the game and before you start taking stats what exactly uh, the manager of the team are looking for. So a performance analyst like a player needs to prepare in order to be a benefit to the team and the management team. Uh, the preparation involves many key things. So you need to be prior to the game, you need to be armed um, with the understanding and knowledge of what the coach is looking for and what the coach requires. You must have agreed targets and definition of your KPIs. Um, you need to know your game day environment. You need to know the venue. Club games um, differ from inter-county games in that at most inter-county games, if not all, apart from challenge games, you're up in a stand, you probably are using a walkie-talkie, you're probably using a small bit of technology. At club games, you will be down on the sideline. Uh, the sideline, as we all know, is chaotic between subs and club officials and everything. You need to know where you're standing, you need to know where the management team are, how you can communicate with the management team and all that, where your stats team are, and they, your stats team need to know their role. So the performance analyst needs to know the KPIs, but it's equally as important that your stats team know what the KPIs are to help them with recording. And most importantly, uh, create and practice with your own template. And for me personally, I think the pre-game template is really important. Um, or the, the designing your template um, and that and I'll go into that in uh, much more detail there but and um, like some clubs might be able to afford some technology for the performance analyst to use on match days but for most the, at club level it will be pen and paper um, and therefore the template that you use is the key component to helping you on match day it must be a living and working document it's live you're recording into it live it, it's constantly changing and evolving and as well as that our template uh, must be smart which i will go into uh, on, in detail now on our next slide because it needs to be here uh, specific it needs to detail the kpi that you're looking at and um, on your template um, the stats that you're taking need to be measurable make it easy to read make it uh, easy for the coach um, or to, for you to read it so that when the coach comes near you, you can tell them what exactly it is or if you spot something happening in the game that you can report it. 
again, targets need to be attainable. And um, I'll give you an example of it is if um, our KPI uh, says that the puck out or the kick out is when the ball leaves the keeper's hand and the first player in possession is now the winner of the puck out or kick out, okay, but yet we decide, or the management team decide that a part of our game plan will be to allow the corner back, be open to receive a kick out or a puck out, and we set a target of winning 60% of the opposition uh, restarts, we're going to score zero. So we need to make the target within the template achievable by the players. Uh, setting a target of a player hitting 20 tackles in a game, some may, some may not, uh, but it needs to be re attainable. And again, realistic, do not overload your template. And um, if you've too much on, on the template, your, your accuracy level comes down, all right? So there's only so much, and this is very important for coaches to realize, there's only so much your performance analysts can do on match day. So any extra information may have to wait until you see the video and you get a chance to look at it again. And finally, time sequence. So within the template, um, ensure that you record the data in a readable sequence. So it'll give you a running record of the game. Uh, this is very important because I'll give you the example of we, just say Newcastle West, four puck outs in a row, and we lose all four puck outs. So I talk to the management team, I say, I give them the information, we have lost four puck outs now in a row because we've gone long, we've lost four in a row. Uh, so then the management team get word into the keeper that, okay, we're going to try a couple of short puck outs and we're going to try and work the ball up the field. Uh, then if we win the next three or four puck outs, they're the most important element. By doing a time sequence, you're staying in the here and now. And um, matches change, they, they ebb and they flow. Your um, your match day template, if you're uh, feeding back in-game stats to the uh, management team, needs to ebb and flow with that. So I'll give you, here is an example of a basic team template that I would use. And again, this is just a snippet of the template I use, but I, I think it's really important that uh, coaches and people doing the stats, you need to work on and create an Excel or Word, your own template, a template that suits you, that you're comfortable with. Um, so this would be a basic template that I would be comfortable with. And again, I'm looking at two KPIs here in particular. I'm looking at puck outs and scoring attempts. Um, so you create your code. So when, I, when we look at puck outs, um, I look for the outcome of the puck out, whether it was won or lost. I look for the type or length of the puck out, whether it was long or short. Again, you have to define that. Is a long puck out any a uh, puck out that goes beyond your 65 is a sharp puck out. Any puck out that goes uh, to a player inside your 45. Then I look at the number of the player who won the puck out and how they won it, whether they won a clean or break. For anyone starting off, I would suggest that you only pick uh, in your code one or two of those first to start and you build from there. So as I'm very wary as we're doing this, that look, there might be some people here just thinking about or a coach is thinking about using it and how, how they can use it um, to benefit the team. So that's how I would personally do it. I started off, um, I remember starting off on a wet cold night down in McNeville Park and um, I was basically, for the puck outs, it was uh, seven win or eight or lost long. And just bit by bit, one or two, details as it was. Actually, that wet and cold windy night, if I remember correctly, only for Gary Kirby's umbrella, we'd have ended up with no stats at all, actually, the same night. But uh, the code for scoring attempts, the same, just the player number and outcome. When I go into the in-game stuff, I will actually show you an example of one of these filled out, and I'll explain that more. For individual stats template, this is just another one, a uh, basic stats template that you can use to starting off. So what you can do here is you can put the player's name in here. Every time they get a ball in possession, you put a tick or they make a tattle, you put a tick. Again, very important that the tattle and defining the possession is done with the coach and manager pre-game. Pre and that that is hugely important that that's how uh, you work it, that you're working off the stats that you've previously um, agreed on. And again, it's just uh, ticking the box and counting it on. So if we look at in-game, so the practicalities of uh, in-game, so managing your stats team. All right, so um, for many people doing stats in club, it can be a single person in the stands doing their 
do, or taking the stats, taking the boxes, doing their numbers and that. But I would uh, call on clubs to uh, look at the potential for finding someone within your club to do the stats for you and for them to get a team of people together to help them. And so, like, aside from the benefit of uh, having more people help you collect data match day, which will allow you collect more and accurate data, um, it also is a golden opportunity, I feel, and it's something that I've tried with my own club and I'd look to implement even further, is if you use players that are maybe of the under-17 bracket that might be just starting out in their adult playing journey in, within the next year, um, because if they start doing stats, they get a deep understanding and insight into what it takes to play, play the game. They look at key moments in the game and as a player, what they need to work on and aspects of it. And a prime example of that now would be the work rate of forwards. Um, the idea of forwards just being the player who gets the ball, takes on the defender and scores and just waits for a good ball into them. That day is long gone. And it's a great opportunity for players to see that. And um, personally, with my stats team, I use a caller and recorder system. Um, I've been lucky with Limerick and with Newcastle West that I've had people willing to volunteer to help me uh, complete the job. So what that is, the caller watches the game and reports to the recorder what is happening in the game. The caller, in essence, is a match day reporter. So the recorder fills out the uh, template and puts the information and the data into the template for you. Um, I find that works best um, because if you're trying to watch the game, then put your head down and mark it. I, I, if you have two people doing that, one calling and one just marking, um, you're definitely going to improve the percentage of accuracy in your data. Communication, so within the stats team, that, that communication is vital. It's, it's vital that there's good, clear, uh, short communication, that the caller isn't talking all day and the recorder is listening to take the information. Also, your communication with management team. At club games, this is actually uh, one of the harder issues to achieve. Um, you're down on the sideline. There's um, a lot of people around. Uh, managers and management teams and coaches get really engrossed in the game, so it's remembering it. So one one tip I would have for that um, is maybe have a selector in the management team that uh, maybe approaches you as the stats or performance analysis uh, person every nine, 10 minutes, or then in game, if something pressing is coming up and an issue is arising, you need to make your way towards the management team. There needs to be a line of communication open with the management team or for the practicality of running in-game stats. Obviously, if you can't communicate with uh, the management team, then you're not going to be able to help them in games. Um, as well as that, uh, on the sideline, make sure you have a clear, your stats team have a clear vision of the game. And uh, club games are can be, as I said, an absolute nightmare with the number of subs, no real dugouts in games, people standing on the sideline and that. So just make sure you have a good view of the game. If you can't see it, you can't record it. Um, then the other thing is avoiding distractions. So um, I, one game uh, I was involved in last year, I remember, and it was coming up to a real uh, important moment in the game. I think we were just on 60 minutes and it was game was coming near an end. It was a level game where we were down a point or it was really tight anyway. And uh, people coming in, it was with the Limerick Miners and people coming into the senior game, turning around to the stats box, asking us uh, who's that wearing, who's number eight there for Limerick or uh, asking us to score or how long left and how is this player doing or how is that player doing. We need to avoid all those distractions. And at club level, that is very, uh, very prevalent where people will approach you during the game. You need to avoid being distracted by others. It takes a lot of concentration when you're doing your work and that's very important. OK, so relaying information, when, who and how. Again, we've dealt with most of that. But when, so when is a trend? A trend might be something that happens two or three times. Again, it's decided between you and the manager, but if you see a team and they've uh, their number 13 keeps drifting out for puck outs or kick outs uh, to take take a ball around the back of the midfielders or something, that's something that needs to be relayed straight away. And again, using your template, inputting data, and it's smart. So we're going to focus now on the template. So in, an in-game template that I would use, and this is a filled up one, it's a mocked up one, just for an example. So we're formatting the data within the template. So we're standardizing the code. 
So for here, the example, so if you look at Limerick puck out uh, one and it says WS7C. So what does that stand for? What does it mean? It means uh, puck out outcome is the W or the L. So it means one puck out length, long or short. So it was a short puck out. It was one by number seven and he won a clean. All right. So that's just a, an example of how I feel in my thing. It gives us a load of extra information. But again, when you start out on this, keep it simple. Keep it uh, to what you can do and build up. And um, it's only in recent times that I've been able to get this amount of data into it. So it just takes time to do it, but it gives us a clear indication of what's happening. So if we look at um, puck outs, so Limerick puck outs then from five to eight, we've lost now four uh, puck outs in a row. All right. So we've lost three of them long, one of them short, but most importantly, um, we've lost three of them on breaking ball. So looking, that's why I'm talking about time sequence data, because in that spell, you can now uh, inform your management team that we're losing uh, puck outs, we're predominantly losing long ones, but we're losing it on the break. So obviously our work rate around the middle third or wherever the ball is landing, and that needs to needs to improve and we're out of uh, positioning for the puck outs. And, uh, but it just gives us that bit of information uh, it's identifying a problem and it's clearly identifying what the problem is. The problem is we're losing long puck outs and we're losing this predominantly on breaking ball. So then the code for uh, scoring attempts. Um, so again, you have the player number and the outcome. So if you look there at the opposition, 6, uh, 13, D. So that means 13 dropped the shark. Uh, a shot short. So we have PT for point, G for goal, and all those there self explanatory at the bottom. But again, they're just giving us a viewpoint on it. If you look at um, the opposition one there and you see quickly 13 is having an impact in the game. Um, 14 has gotten two shots off and has been very accurate. So we may have to look at how teams are delivering the ball inside. Again, um, at club level in that, um, you, and depending on the number of people you have taken sets, to keep the accuracy up, just keep what you're recording to a minimum. But even in an in-game template, just looking at puck outs and scoring attempts, we're getting a lot more information. Um, and it's shown us that we're not just looking at the number of voids or drop shots, we're actually looking at what's happening in the game. So half time. Half time is a very, very important uh, area of the of the game, and um, your your time allocated is ten minutes. So again, our information must be clear, accurate, and easy for the management team to understand. Half time, we all know, can be chaotic, and actually, I found in a winning dressing room, half time can nearly be more chaotic because there's a lot of chatting, a lot of talk. There's a bit of a buzz of excitement. Players are high. Sometimes you, um, the performance analyst at halftime has the opportunity to just keep uh, the team focused at halftime by being clear, factual, and calm. You're removing opinion, emotion, just dealing facts. And that this is very, very important. And um, because um, at halftime, again, whether you're winning, losing, or whatever way the game is going for you, players will need only two or three points. We all know this as coaches. We can't bombard them with, with um, information. So within some club settings, and that I've seen it where performance analysts and that are asked to present data to the team at halftime. So just a few tips for that. I would say, again, be positive. As Shawnee said, catch them doing the positive. Um, it's very important you do not individualize in a team setting. So you don't lay the blame uh, number eight, your default, you, your man has won seven puck outs. Like that, that won't help the situation. So we do not individualize it in the team setting. And we have to ensure that you do not veer away from the message that the manager wants to relay. So this is uh, very important. If when you come down at halftime, you're talking to the management team, they're your first port to call. Even if you are wanted or needed by the manager to go into the dressing room and give out the stats, you, the management team need to know the stats first. And the reason they need to know the stats is because when they go in to give the message, if you've bombarded players with stats, management team come in, the message gets lost. It's um, all of a sudden the players are looking at each other going, which of the five or six points that we were just told will help us in the second half. So um, I think the halftime is very important to be just clear your information, clear factual and can. 
make sure the management team and yourself and the PA have agreed what is to be said, how is it to be presented, and that and that the message is consistent. So post game. So when you look at post game, um, you, so so you've gathered the data in the game. So what's next? So you summarize and finalize the data, do the maths, get the tallies and the percentages. So that's where we're just basically counting up you know, how many puckouts we've won, how many we've lost, how many shots we've had. You analyze the data. So when you analyze the data, look to identify trends. OK, so we're looking to identify trends. So we look for trends in game. And um, did we achieve the targets we set out? Again, these targets need to be measurable and attainable. And um, so realistically, did we win 60% of puckouts? Was our shooting accuracy over 60%? And then you display or present the data in a clear, simple, and easily read, give information that's relevant and appropriate. So what I'm going to show you now next is just a sample of a feedback one. I've it's a met up game um, from that I just met up just to show you here. So this would be an example of a post-game feedback template that I would use. And um, so uh, the game I just doesn't matter the team or whatever, but what I want you to look at there. Um, and your post game feedback template. Have we included our KPI targets? And are we showing our top individual performers if we do individual stats? So, for example, here, um, we can see clearly that our target shooting accuracy is 60%. We hit 64%. That's positive. We scored 23 out of 36 chances. On our puckouts, our target was 60%. Um, but uh, yeah, however, in our puckouts, our target 60, we hit 58%. Now you're not too far off it. That's only the, to reach your target there is possibly winning one or two extra things. So let's look at where that potentially might have gone wrong. So you want the management team to look at this. So if you look at Limerick, uh, Limerick's puckouts there, um, we won 11 of our own and we lost eight. We won eight long and three short puckouts. But if you look at the eight that Wexford won in this uh, mock up template, They've won six of our short. So maybe we need to work on a training in game the next time. We need to look at when we go short with the puck out, working the ball out. So the, the data that you're giving is are we hitting the targets or not? And how are we achieving those? Look at the Wexford puck outs. Target was 60. We were way off at, at 43%. So Wexford, Wexford, if you look at it, won um, 11 of their puck out, 17 went puck out went short. Are we set, setting up right to defend the sharp puck out? Um, are we working hard enough? So then these are the things that we need to look at in the game. So the individual performers, who's the top possession, top tattler, top puck out winner. So all these informations give us snippets into it. And again, it's to provide, you provide this feedback to the management team and you want the coach to use it to guide preparation for the next thing. So again, the title count and the aim should always be the forwards win the title count. Here, the forwards uh, won the title count and it impacted um, on our scoring chances and scoring chances created. You need to link every stat you gain or every time you put stat in a feedback sheet like this, it needs to be relevant. It needs to link to your to the coach's philosophy. It needs to link back to what we're doing as a team, what we're looking, uh, looking for. So I'll move it on there. So the benefits of using a performance analyst in the club setting. So for any coaches out there that haven't used the performance analyst um, before, I would say, I would suggest to you that it's a vital uh, tool that you can use. Um, in terms of you, you basically are getting another person to help you with your uh, preparation uh, and coaching sessions. Uh, they're giving you factual information. Players love dealing in facts. Players do not really like dealing in opinions or being told their opinion. I don't think you're working hard enough for that. They want to, de want to deal in facts. So are you arm the coach with factual information on how the team are, per are performing. You, it allows you focus on areas of improvement needed to further develop the team. And again, for players, the, there's a massive benefit of using a performance analyst in a club setting. And again, I refer to Pat Jones' as safe, safe to fail uh, a topic that he covered in last week's um, webinar. And like, if you have a safe to fail environment, players will embrace the use of a performance analyst. It, like, it should not be used to catch someone out, but used for improvement. To show a player that they, that extra tackle that they made in a game uh, benefited the team, that extra run they made 
benefit of the team. Like, and it shows that using of a PA shows all the cumulative moments in a game all come together and they give you a clear, as clear as possible picture of the game, where it's won and where it's lost. And um, so I would say the benefits of using a performance analyst in the club setting are really, really important. And I, I know that some out there might think, OK, this is an intercounty kind of a thing. Really, the benefit is there to be seen with uh, within club. And um, I see it even when you're using it, the benefit of using younger, younger players who are just about to come onto an adult team, the benefit for them of seeing what actually counts in a game why we need to do these things, why I need to work harder, why I need to understand the moments in the game. So uh, this is just uh, the final slide for me. Uh, key points to remember in game, are your stats helpful? Are they contributing? Are they relevant? Post game, can the data gather guide preparation again for the next match? For the coach, are we arming the coach with factual information to help the team progress? And the players, when you get the players on side and in the pre-game, um, you need to explain to the players what the KPIs are. You need to present to them, like you do to your stats team, like you do uh, with your uh, coach and you agree, the players need to know what you're looking for. And it helps with the process of the game and makes players more tactically aware and develops a better understanding. Um, and are we showing our players how individual moments accumulate in collective success? And by use of performance analysts, you can see the value in every player, not just the strong player in your team. So thank you very much for taking the time for listening. I hope that's helped. If you have any questions or need any help or anyone starting out stats looking for someone just to talk to or uh, have a chat with, I have my email put up there, keenanalysis at gmail.com. So don't hesitate to contact me. Thanks very much. That's great, Pat. Thank, Thank you. you. And thanks, thanks to, to Sean and everyone. 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 Um, um, so, so, what we're going to have, we'll just take, take, take a quick question, question here. Uh, um, so, the first one I'm, I'm looking at, I'm going to maybe just mute the microphone there for a minute there, lads. I mean, just the first, the first question, question looking at is just someone was um, uh, sample templates that, that can be used um, to record. That is, is, is there some place that people can get some sample templates, templates that they can use, or would it be better off to um, design their own? So, Sean or Pat, if one of you want to take that question, um, I'll, I'll take uh, this one, Sean. Is that, that okay? okay. There? Um, the, what I, I find is that um, creating a sample or getting a sample in a generic template uh, may not um, be suitable for your needs. And to create a match day template, really, you need to know the KPIs and have agreed your KPIs with your uh, coach or management team. And it's very important then that you create your own because ultimately it's your template that you'll be working on. If you create it, you will actually find it easier to implement a match day. And um, I know there, there are probably generic uh, samples out there in that, but I would, I would encourage anyone starting off to really look and at uh, creating their own template because that's the template you will use and it makes it relevant to you. And over time, over time, I must have changed my template eight or nine times in two years and each time it's improved it for me. Very good. Thanks for that, Pat. And I suppose just a, a follow on then from that, like, and Sean mentioned at the start as well, the, the word, the three letters KPIs were used a lot there. So, for for someone starting out first, what what would you recommend as being the most important or effective KPIs that that stats people should look at at club? Do you want me to take that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um. Again, I I alluded to it earlier on. I, I think in that in that circumstance, you really need to have a chat with your coach and have a chat with the manager and sit down and decide. You know what KPIs are the most important for you. And um, like I could say to you to know, uh, you know, shooting accuracy is very, very important. As Pat alluded to it there, you need it over 60% or, you know, uh, tackle accuracy is very important. Maybe in a football sense, it's about applying pressure, that that's critically important. And, um, you know, I, I think 
that each team is different and how each team plays is different. So, like, if you're looking at, say, in a hurling sense, you're looking at maybe, uh, you know, Kilkenny and, you know, Wexford. They're going to play the game totally differently. So both sides are going to have totally different KPIs. So to me, the way how you do the KPI is you would sit down with your coach and your manager and you chat through what are the most important things we need to be recording and you get, then you would prioritize them. You pick your five or your six and you say, right, OK, these are the ones we're going after. Whether they are you know, puck out retention, whether they are uh, shooting accuracy, whatever they are, uh, you can only record, you know, on match day, four, five, that is it. You can't re be recording 10, 15 things. And you actually need to tell the coach and the manager, I can't do that. It is not possible for me to do it. Because uh, I know I've seen some of the questions there about having, you know, stats teams and multiple guys doing it. In the club scene, you might have only one guy doing it who has an interest in this. And that one guy needs to be able to say, sorry, I can't record, you know, possessions, tackles, turnovers, puck outs won shooting accuracy, entries into scoring zone, not possible. We need to now prioritize what are the key things we're looking at and go after those. And then if we find that one or two of those aren't that important, then we can change them. And as I was saying, it's a living document. You can go back and change that stat sheet and, you know, update it over time. But certainly I'd only be picking, you know, four or five with the conversation has to be made between you, coach and manager. Very good, Sean. Yeah, and I think I think that that's key at the start. Maybe having your one or two or three or four vital stats that that the coach will be looking for. And I suppose an added question for that, then, John and, and Pat spoke about in his chat in his presentation as well, is that the challenge of trying to get your your stats accurately while all the stuff is going on, and then being able to get stuff to the man to the manager maybe during the game, or even getting accurate stuff to them at half time. You know, how is there any tips that you can give people how to go about that? Yeah, I suppose in the club sense, there's a few important ones that I would always do myself. One, I would try and take myself away from the subs bench and take myself away from whatever officials are there and try and isolate myself. And um, because if you're on the subs bench, you know, guys are making comments and they're, you know, they're talking to you and they, they, they're, they're having their own input. So certainly I, I wouldn't like to see the guy recording the stats in beside the actual subs inside in the inside in, inside in the, the dugout. Uh, equally, you know, you didn't you need to fi fix yourself in a position where you have good view of the field. Like we all know if you're say if you're in, 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 in Martinstown at a game and uh, everybody's on the sideline, uh, you need to be in a position where you can see see everything. Equally, you need to position yourself in a position where you can get over to the manager and to the coach, you know, at critical times to give them critical messages. So, like, there's no point in putting yourself, you know, 50 yards away where you've got to, or on the other side of the field, where you have to run across to the coach and the manager to tell them what's, you know, what's going on. So, to me, uh, you know, don't position yourself in the dugout. Uh, keep yourself isolated from all that rubbish that is going on there. Uh, you know, keep yourself isolated to a certain extent from the coach, but you need to be in a position where you can get to them and talk to them quickly um, when you have to. Uh, then the, the, the accuracy piece, that is done by removing yourself from all those distractions. You'd be surprised how accurate you would be when, when uh, you know, when you have removed yourself from all the distractions that are going on around you. Uh, and then you just have to remember you're not a supporter while you're doing that, that actual work. We're actually, you are an integral part of the team. So your job is to stay, you know, objective, uh, stay in the moment, stay doing your job. Thanks for that, Sean. And then another one here. Um, I suppose it's probably a useful question for people who are starting out. And it's it, the question revolves around the coach asking you to record something and if you have an opinion that it may it may not contribute towards an element of the game what what would you think and have either of you ever had um stuff that you were told to record that you felt yourself may not have been um, relevant to, to the game what would be your views on that 
do you, do you want to take a turn your life? I don't mind. I, I, okay, I, I, I'll, uh, well, like, I think at the end of the day, it uh, comes down to what Sean was saying earlier about building relationships and building that trust. Um, and I think if you've built a relationship and a trust, I, I think you'll find that you can have that discussion or discussion with the, uh, with the coach uh, about it. But ultimately, uh, your analysis is coach-led. So if it's something that the coach feels is important, um, it's important that you uh, fulfill your duty to the coach to um, to complete it. Again, it depends on what what he's looking for. And I think I talked towards the end of it there about um, coaches not using it um, to catch someone out or prove a point, a negative point for someone, but to see it as a learning tool and to see that every issue a player may have if you understand the problem, you might be able to help improve the player in that area. But I do think in that scenario, like this is why your relationship with the coach is very important, because if you have that relationship built, you can have that discussion and the trust will be built. I think then ultimately um, your analysis is coach led. So you would fulfill that uh, role if possible. And again, if you're doing it on match day and you're on your own and it's another layer on top of what you're doing, like that's making it unrealistic and the stats not attainable if it's too much information. So that may mean compromising on another uh, piece of information that day. Yeah, can I just come in on that as well, right? So let's, you know, equally agree, every, absolutely everything just Pat, Pat said there. Equally, like if you have a hunch that something isn't important, uh, go away and research it. Get your information, do your research, and then you can find out, like don't have a hunch that you think this is important, or you don't think this is important. No. So be able to go to the coach after a period of time and say, well, I have the research done. I have five or six or 10 or 15 games looked at. And this stat isn't important and this stat is. So that's like that's been over a period of time how you uh, I suppose you, you equip the team with the key performance indicators that are going to uh, help you to win. Uh, equally, you don't like you don't turn around to the coach and say no, I'm not collecting because I don't think that's right. Go away, mm -hmm. find out, get your information, build a bank of information so that you can actually come with an actual accurate uh, you know, answer to the question that the coach is posing. Really good. Uh, some some very good information there. Just just about two two three more questions, and the, the next few just a couple of simple uh, things that people are looking for. So, um, some set, simple software or app that you you find useful. Um, again, I think Sean, you might have mentioned in the presentation too about affordable video kits. Um, so if just if you've any one or two there, I can jot them down in the notes here for for people to see. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So like, there's obviously. I spoke about, you know, video quality being very, very important, but like you can pick up, you know, good, cheap, secondhand video cameras because everything now is recorded in 4K, right? But if you look at most video cameras and most video that's put online is either 720p or 1080p. So the cameras they're setting are way, way above the system, you know, what are required for, you know, even presenting on any screen. So you get you can get pick up a Canon or a Panasonic or uh, you know a, a, a Sony uh, camera for maybe three four hundred euros. You pick them up really really handy on eBay if you keep an eye out for it. And um, equally GoPros you pick up you know GoPro Hero fives and sixes you pick them up for maybe two three hundred euros on eBay at the moment. There doesn't have to be a lot of money spent in it. With regard to the software. Um, say uh, we've used Statapult on a good number of occasions. Um, Dini who does you know does the stats with us. Does uses uh, Statapult and really really brilliant app. And um, equally, um, like for our in-game analysis, we're using Naxport, and I think you can get Naxport uh, as cheap as two hundred and fifty or three hundred euros. Um, I know that Huddle and Sports Code have a number of solutions. They're a bit more expensive, but again, they're very, very robust and they're very, very good. I know there's an Irish company, uh, Performa Sports. They, they they have software, and so there is a huge amount of software out there, and there is software to um, to I suppose match every budget. 
um, you probably need to have a chat with your um, manager or coach or treasurer to see what kind of budget is out there. In most of these places, you with most clubs that I know that I know, uh, there probably isn't a budget for it. And um, so very often I would just go and get the camera, get the camera myself if, if you're using it. Uh, it's a really, really good investment. And at least then afterwards, if, if, if you're you're finishing with it, you have the actual camera. So you can get lots of equipment uh, really, really cheap. Excellent. And, and, and there's just two to finish. One is and it's probably even even a coaching question more than a stats question, question particularly. It's the um, what would you define? You know, you mentioned the tackle and you mentioned how important the tackle can be used in, in work rate. So what is what is the documented uh, definition for a tackle on match day? What are you defining as a, a tackle on match day? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so do you want me, do you want me to? Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll let you take this one there, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Pat. No water. Um, <laughs> okay, so th there are a huge number of definitions of what a tackle is, um, you know, particularly in, in, in hurling and equally in football. Um, to me, you need to have a chat with the, co with the coach. And again, I've said this on a ho whole series of occasions and find out what their definition of a tackle is. And then when you've, I suppose, in the go you talk through that with the coach, find out, is that actually countable? Can I actually count what the coach is saying? So if it's, you know, deny, dispossess, and um, maybe it's some delay, right? I, I, I've heard those definitions equally. I've heard contact tackles, so it's an actual count of a contact where a person makes makes contact with with either you know the slitter or the person, whatever that is. Or if in you know, football, it's it's you know forcing the opponent maybe to change direction or maybe forcing the opponent to turn back. Whatever the coach defines the the tackle as, you need to go with that. Reason being that. As the actual coach is talking through, say, the tackle in drills, they are going to be using their own terminology on what the tackle is. And whatever terminology they use needs to be married with the same terminology you're using. There's no point in the coach talking about contact tackles, but you're talking about, you know, dispossessing, denying, delaying. So to me, uh, and whatever one you, you decide on, Stick with that then so that you're consistent right across a whole period of time so that you can build up information on it. That's really important. So like there is, uh, from, what, from what I know, I think there are two papers published in Hurling and um, one by um, Colm Clear there in 2017 and um, really, really good paper on attacking profiles in elite hurling. Again, the tackle not really defined in it and um, the uh, previous um, one to that was in 2008, which just outlined what the main skills in hurling were. So there is very, very little published um, actual information out on hurling and equally on actually defining the tackle. So to me, talk to the coach, talk to the manager, find out what they define the tackle as, and if it's measurable, run with that. And uh, just there as well, well on that with Shawnee, like, and everything's right. And I think the key, no matter what the stat is there for anyone out there, is it's the consistency of recording it, like, and it being countable. Like, it has to be measurable within what you're doing. So just to, and that's with any stat that's out there, you, you just have to be consistent, and that will give you the data as well. For me, I think we've a, we've a definition. Um, where it's a contact made that in influences an opposition player to do something they don't want to do. So that's kind of what from Limerick Winers what we're kind of looking at. So um, and that but it's just a case of um, being consistent. Once you find that definition and you've talked through the definition with your coach, be consistent with it. Excellent, thanks. I, I, what, what, what I can gather all through your, your presentation there is that the relationship that between the coach and, and, and the, the stats person performs is, is, a, is a very, very important relationship. So I think you mentioned that several times. I think very much starting out is important to, to bear that in mind. It is about your, your relationship that, that you build up as well. Um, just one final one then, and it's about just, just you were talking, Pat, about the, the poet. Uh, match analysis form and the way you present that. Question here is about: Would you typically share all that information with the full team, or just relate to the manager and coach? 
Um, it's mixed really. Again, it's uh, predefined. Now, initially, you would relate it, um, I would relate it to the management team. So, um, because you're hoping that first it guides what the coach is doing. The individual stats, what I find um, works best um, for me now, I deal mainly with a minor level and um, now at club level as well. Um, I think the, the individual stats should be something that players should be able to approach the performance analysts for. With, again, with uh, the permission and the blessing of the uh, of the man of the coach and that. Um, I find that um, especially at club level, um, if I, um, if you're displaying all the individual stats um, on players and that and that feedback. Um, I think it kind of players can be very shy about asking you there for there and then for it, and it can it can depending on a player's stats, it can be and have a negative impact in the dressing room and that. But I I do think for me personally that that one I showed you would go directly to the management team first, and then I would talk with the management team if there was something showing up uh, for individual players, we would look at how we would. Um, how we would look at it. That's why when you do it, you look at the top uh, total. Um, for me anyway, I look at the top total, so top possessions, top total count. And then when players come to you, they come to you then in a learning and a kind of a safer environment for them, a set where they want to learn. So they discover how far off that they were and that. But I do think, again, it depends on the players you're dealing with. Um, some players might not have an interest in this, and it's to build that trust first before you go um, public, publicly uh, publicising all the stats in each individual player. Um, again, um, different management teams would vary on that. Um, would it, but for me personally, that, that first information would go first to the management team, then possibly to the team. I have done um, one thing that works uh, fine with that presentation uh, and template that I showed you at the end is I have put on whiteboards and dressing rooms for the team to look at as a, a starting discussion point. And then you're hoping that the players uh, look at it and then they start to come to you looking for their own individual stats. So there's a number of ways of approaching that, um, but for me, that's the way I would go. I would go and talk to the management team first. Okay. Excellent. Th th thanks for that, Pat. Um, that's, well, I think we, we leave it at that for this evening. We've had um, an excellent presentation there for the last hour and 20 minutes and, and some very good good questions that were, that were coming in there from, from, from the guys. Um, as I said, with, with the club stuff coming up now, it's, the key message there is building your relationship and, and then recording some of the simple stuff first and taking some particularly on board what the lads said at the start about, about starting this. I think one thing they both mentioned was the fact that it is a journey and it, it, it is a process that, that, that evolves over time. So I would like to thank all of you that, that tuned in for the evening. Uh, it's, it's really good to see you all coming coming online um, as we're getting closer to our return to play. I hope you can, you got some benefit from this. I'd like particularly like to thank both uh, Sean and Pat for the time they put into this. Um, and I approached them a couple of weeks back about it. They bought them without hesitation to they'd, they'd love to do it. I know behind the scenes they put a huge amount of work into the presentation and they've been chatting to each other a good bit over it. Um, so I really want to thank the lads for the time and effort they've they, they put into it to, to deliver that with uh, an extreme passion that they have for the for the actual for the actual um the, the whole area. Uh, finally, just to you guys again, thanks very, very much. Um, hope you all keep safe and well and uh, just uh, sharpening the coaching skills for the next couple of weeks. Uh, we'll be the formal open up again for our, our webinar next week, which will be uh, looking at a return to play and return to and things to watch out for when we return. Dara Drew will be presenting that. Dara is the, um, the SNC coach with the Hurling Academy and he's also been involved with the Pierce and some other clubs as well. And he'll be looking at what we need to watch out for when we're starting to get our, our players back into action. So once again, guys, thanks very, very much for your time. Uh, enjoy the rest of the week and we'll chat to you all next week. Take care.